All right. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well on this nice evening. Um, just for an introduction, uh, my name is Slater Rusa. I know that it says that Mark Nutter next to my picture, but um, I'm just borrowing his account. So uh, I'm Slater and I work at the uh, New Hampshire uh, Audubon Massabesic Center, um, the education coordinator there. Um, and uh, before we get started, I'd like to just go into an introduction um, and acknowledge that this presentation is streaming to you from our state headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire, um, which is located within the site of an ancient village of Penacook in the Indikina, which is the tra traditional ancestral homeland and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples, uh, both past and present. I would like to acknowledge that in honor of uh, and acknowledge and honor with gratitude uh, the land and the waterways and our ancestors of the uh, Alnabak or human beings who have stewarded the Indikina throughout generations uh, for thousands of years. Uh, the New Hampshire Audubon is honored to continue uh, the stewardship of these lands and providing opportunities for all people to form connections to the natural world through our programs and wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state. Uh, I invite you to learn more about the indigenous presence on the land you occupy, occupy uh, by visiting the website uh, nativeland.ca. Uh, here you can explore and click on territories of indigenous people and get connected to the resources to learn more. Um, and for a more in-depth understanding of the Granite State, check out all the educational resources at indigenousnh.com. Uh, including this interactive story map here. Um, this details the indigenous presence and all their stories here in New Hampshire. All right, so thank you for your interest in tonight's topic, which is uh, conserving land, New Hampshire's history and today. Uh, this talk is the 22nd session of a year long webinar series called Exploring Connections and Stewardship of the Natural World. Uh, and is supported by the New Hampshire Humanities Council grant. Uh, the past recordings of these excellent talks could be found on the New Hampshire Audubon's YouTube page, uh, which are also linked in the series webpage. Um, throughout this series, we are exploring the intersection of the sciences and the humanities, uh, finding and forging new ways to connect with nature and learn about the importance of conservation action. I want to invite you to really take the time and space to consider how tonight's topic informs, strengthens, and otherwise supports how you define yourself as a person, uh, and how you use this topic to connect with human communities as well as the wild ones. I implore you to reflect on why this topic is important to you uh, and your personal value system and how you can connect uh, with others throughout this top, through this topic in your daily life. Before I hand it over to Diane to introduce tonight's presenter, Paul Dosher, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly describe how uh, this webinar fits in with the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. So for those of you who don't know, uh, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental nonprofit organization that is completely independent from the National Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission, uh, which has four programmatic pillars. Connecting people to, uh, sorry, connecting people to nature through environmental education experiences like school programs, nature day camps, and webinars like these. Researching and conserving species in peril, including large raptors and small birds. We also manage about 10,000 acres of wildlife uh, sanctuaries throughout the state for habitat and recreation. And we also advocate for sound environmental policy in the New Hampshire State Le Legislature. Uh, I am able to be here today because of donors and members like you. Uh, we also rely on a huge network of volunteers that assist us with wildlife monitoring, ambassador animal care, environmental education, and wildlife sanctuary management throughout the state. Uh, if you are a volunteer, member, or supporter of NH Audubon, I would like to sincerely thank you. Uh, we simply could not achieve our charitable mission without you. If you'd like to become a part of our conservation family today, which I hope you do, uh, please check out our website for ways to get involved. 
Um, we do have about 50 people registered for tonight's evening talk, so uh, you'll see that we are in full webinar mode. Uh, please feel free to use the chat for any thoughts, comments, questions, or reactions that you might have. Um, and then you could use the Q&A button for any uh, questions that you would like to be uh, answered directly. Um, it's a pretty cool feature uh, because other people can uh, upvote questions that they also want to hear. Um, and it'll help me and Diane kind of pick which questions uh, Paul will answer in the limited amount of time that we have. Um, so I would like to give a quick shout out to Diane DeLuca, who is our senior biologist responsible for or orchestrating this series. Uh, without her leadership and coordination, this webinar series would not happen. So thank you, Diane. Um, Diane and I will be monitoring both the Q&A here in Zoom and on Facebook Live, uh, which we are streaming to this evening. Um, and I have set, oh, I already told you about that. <laughs> um, in the event that we have more questions than we have time to answer, uh, we can handpick a few of these questions. Uh, from here, uh, I would like to hand it over to Diane to introduce tonight's presenter. Thanks, Slater. Um, and I'd just like to thank Slater for stepping in for Mark and doing a great job on the technical side. Um, I have very poor internet here, so hopefully I'll be able to stay with you the whole time. And that's why I'm just a face on the screen instead of an actual video. But we're very pleased tonight to have Paul Dasher with us. Uh, many of you probably know Paul, but Paul worked for 28 years at the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forest, retiring in 2014 as the Vice President for Land Conservation. His work involved acquisition of land and conservation easements and stewardship of the Forest Society's more than 800 conservation easements. The Forest Society is one of the nation's oldest land trusts founded in 1901. And during Paul's tenure, the Forest Society protected or helped protect nearly 400,000 acres across the entire state. Paul also served as the board chair of the Piscataquag Land Conservancy um, and as a member of the Land Trust Alliance's standards advisory team, Paul helped the Alliance revise and update its national land trust standards and practices. He has written numerous articles and publications on land conservation, including amending or terminating conservation easements, conforming to state charitable trust requirements, guidelines for New Hampshire easement holders, which was written with the New Hampshire Attorney General. Paul and his wife, Deb, own and operate Wincrest Farm, an organic Christmas tree farm and certified tree farm in Ware, New Hampshire. And they were named the 1986 National Organic Gardeners of the Year by Rodale's Organic Gardening Magazine. So they're quite talented in that regard. And they protected their farm with a conservation easement in 2004. So tonight, Paul will share some history of land conservation steps to take to protect land and why protecting private land is an essential part of ensuring the future of wildlife habitat, agriculture, forestry, and outdoor recreation in New Hampshire. So Paul, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. We're very excited for your presentation. Thanks, Diane. Um, uh, I hope I can live up to the expectations here. Um, I see some names of some friends that uh, that I know on this call, and I suspect a few of them know almost as much about this as I do. So I am going to jump right into uh, sharing my screen here, and we'll hope that this works as it's supposed to. Um, okay, tell me, Diana, are we looking at the first slide? Looks good, Mark. Looks good, Paul. All right. Perfect. Yep. All right. I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, give you a, a little bit of history um, of land conservation uh, to try to set the context for what we do today. Um, many of us are aware of the great work that's done by land trusts throughout New Hampshire. Um, but and some of us are aware of the history of the protection of land within New Hampshire that goes back before land trusts got involved. And then others will probably uh, know more details about the history of conservation in America in certain aspects than I do. But I'm gonna give you an overview 
of some of this. And there are some things that had to be left out for just the you know, fact that there's not enough time to uh, get into every little detail, but we'll get started uh, on that right now. So what have we conserved in the United States? Um, and, and over the years, uh, going back more than a century, uh, we've conserved unique ecosystems through um, public ownership and private land conservation. We focused on scenic areas and vistas. We've conserved unusual geologic features, important wildlife habitat for game and other species. We've conserved forests and their watersheds, recreational trails, waterways, and wilderness areas, etc. cetera. Um, and we have individual pieces of legislation that worked to preserve each of these um, over time, both at the state and federal level. So let's talk a little bit about this, uh, unique ecosystems. We have obviously sought to protect old growth forests in many places, prairies, Arctic tundra, mountains, wetlands, et cetera. And examples of that, of course, include places like the Everglades, the Redwoods, um, Arctic Alaska, the Rocky Mountains, Southern Appalachians, Shishores, islands, et cetera. Um, those are all examples of that. Um, unique landscapes have been a focus of much of our conservation work. You know, we think, talk about the Grand Canyon, Death Valley, uh, the Painted Desert National Monument, Glacier National Park, Katy National Park, Yellowstone. To some extent, those were conserved because they were unusual, unique landscapes for, that's the primary reason. And then of course we have wildlife habitat and the National Wildlife Refuge System, which is conserved places that you, many of you are familiar with, uh, such as the Great Swamp in New Jersey, the largest uh, of the wildlife refuges, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Of course, we have the Great Bay Nas National Wildlife Refuge here in New Hampshire, just over the border in Massachusetts, Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, our newest national wildlife refuge in New Hampshire, the Umbagog National Wildlife Refuge, and of course, over in Maine, the Wells is nearby, the National Wildlife Refuge is there. And then, of course, there's been a focus on productive natural resources. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, national forests that started out mostly in the Western states. Most recently, national forests were created in Alaska. And of course, the Eastern National Forest, such as the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire and Maine, was created uh, much later than the original national forests were um, through an act of Congress. So let's go and dive into this a little bit more in detail. The first national parks, of course, were created uh, in 1864 with the creation or establishment of Yosemite National Park. At the time, it was owned by the state of California um, and it was designated as a national park in 1890. Um, but uh, it was one of those places that became, if you will, the, the uh, touchstone for the creation of national parks. And of course, Congress created Yellowstone National Park in 1872 in the Wyoming Territory and of course, uh, some of you knew this and others may not, but at the time Yellowstone was created, it was actually uh, supervised and managed by the, uh, by the United States Army under, uh, under the orders of Theodore Roosevelt, who was concerned because uh, at the time that it was created, the uh, poaching process of uh, a problem of uh, uh, wildlife being uh, poached in Yellowstone was severe and Roosevelt basically decided that the only way to stop that problem was to send the military in. So they were the first managers of the national park. Today, the national parks have 52.2 million acres. And I think it's useful to remember the 52 million acre number as we go through the rest of the presentation, because you'll see um, that there, many of the other public lands we have are in fact larger than in national parks in total. Even though we have 63 national parks, there are 423 actual units in the national park system, including preserves, monuments, historic parks, um, and sites that, uh, that don't qualify as official national parks. A little bit about the dawn of conservation um, in, in the uh, United States. Um, the term was coined originally by Gifford Pinchot and endorsed by Theodore Roosevelt. Pinchot was a forester who came to the United States, I believe he was born in Europe and uh, uh, was advocating for scientific forestry. At the time that Pinchot got started in this business, uh, forestry in the United States could be more adequately uh, categorized as forest clearing. We were doing a lot of a removal of timber and forest with very little thought about what would follow afterwards. And of course, the history of the White Mountains is a good example of that uh, in the early 20th century and late 19th century. The forest essentially was uh, um, 
denuded of trees by the efforts of uh, loggers to basically uh, maximize the economic return without consideration for what the consequences would be. Um, Pinchot was concerned with forest protection after decades of forest abuse in much of the nation and Roosevelt was a major proponent of this new approach to land. So the creation of the National Forest Place in 1891 with the Forest Reserve Act and enabled the president to set aside portions of the public domain as reservations and Roosevelt did not shy away from doing that. He generated a uh, uh, considerable number of national forests through essentially executive action. He transferred the forest reserves to the Department of Agriculture in 1905 and established the Forest Service with Pinchot as chief. Um, in 1905, there were 63 million acres of national forest, which is, as you will recall, about 10 million acres more than uh, the total number of national parks that exist today. Not the total number of units in the national park system, but the national parks themselves. Today, there are about 190 million acres in the national forest, 155 of them. You're probably familiar with many of them, so I won't go into the great details there. Um, but all of the original national forests were in the West and created from the public domain, the land that was acquired by the United States, much of it through the Louisiana Purchase. Um, in 1911, the Weeks Act, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sponsored by Congressman John Weeks from Massachusetts, who was a native of Lancaster, New Hampshire, um, was established to create the uh, authority to purchase lands east of the Mississippi for national forests. And of course, the goal of that original Weeks Act was primarily to protect watersheds of rivers to provide for the conservation and the improvement of uh, the, the condition of the rivers in the Eastern United States, which were suffering severely under the, the loss of forest cover, especially in New Hampshire. The forests were established as multiple use lands, unlike the national parks. So on national forests, you have timber as a, as a resource, you have wildlife, you have recreation, water protection. And in the West, you have grazing. And then of course, we now have wilderness on national forests as a result of the Wilderness Act that came along much later. Roosevelt also has <clears throat> established the first national wildlife refuges. Um, and this is a quote from him. Oh, the wild beasts and birds are by right, not the property merely of the people who are alive today, the property of unknown generations whose belongings we have no right to squander. Um, and the first refuge was created at the Pelican Island National Wildlife Refuge in 1903 in Florida. The creation of the refuges was inspired in part by the extinction of the passenger pigeon, the last one having died um, a little bit later on in 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, while Pelican Island, <coughs> excuse me, while Pelican Island was the first refuge, Others were quickly created uh, after that, again, by, uh, by the decision of Roosevelt, as well as through acts of Congress. Uh, in 1929, the Migratory Bird Conservation Act authorized the Secretary of Interior to purchase land for refuges. And that was really the beginning of a change in the way we uh, identified and designated uh, federal conservation lands, which had previously all come out of the public domain in the first place. So now we went into a different mode where we could acquire land from private ownership to create wild refuges, refuges. And today, of course, there are 150 million acres of um, wild refuges, 18 million in the lower 48, 562 of them altogether. And of course, the largest refuges are in Alaska. And those were created out of the Alaska Lands Act, which was passed back in the early 1970s that established the, the way lands would be uh, divided in Alaska between federal ownership, lands conveyed to the Native American corporations, lands conveyed to the state of Alaska, and some lands that were later uh, conveyed into uh, other uses. Um, the Alaska um, National Wildlife Refuges are the largest, of course, of any in the United States. The other public land ownership in the United States is, if you will, all of the rest, the stuff that didn't get turned into national parks, national wildlife refuges, or national forests remained under the guidance and ownership, if you will, of the Bureau of Land Management. And they were basically given about 400 million acres to deal with. And most of it is used for a whole bunch of possible uses, including extractive uses for oil and gas. And you can see that lower left-hand slide there, which shows an area in Wyoming where uh, natural gas wells dot the landscape as far as the eye can see. 
that's all Bureau of Land Management land. And some argue that land's not truly really protected because of that. Um, it, although some land has been taken from the Bureau of Land Management and converted to other uses over time, such as national parks uh, and national forests. That land is entirely, the BLM land is entirely in the Western United States. You can see a huge amount of it there. The state of Nevada is almost 90% uh, BLM land. Uh, it's an area that uh, generates considerable controversy because most of that is leased to agriculture, to ranchers, um, some of whom uh, have a different concept of what public land ownership means than the public does. Um, and you've probably heard some of those stories. Um, but the BLM land uh, stretches all the way from Montana down to New Mexico, as you can see. This gives you some general idea of public lands in the US in general and what percentage of the country is public land. And as you can see, the vast majority of it is west of the Mississippi River and the portions that are east of the Mississippi River are all areas that were acquired for public ownership um, at some point, probably after around the turn of the century from um, 1900 or so. Wilderness, I talked about wilderness earlier, just briefly, but the Wilderness Act was actually something that came along more recently. Uh, it was passed in 1964, relatively uh, almost unanimous approval by Congress at, uh, at that particular point and established preserves within existing federal lands, roughly today about 9.1 million acres. They, were, they have to be designated by Congress. Um, so they are not created by an act of the executive branch of government or by the agencies that control the land. Uh, and there are, of course, numerous areas within the White Mountain National Forest that have been created by a series of acts of Congress over time. Um, wilderness allows no human manipulation, motorized uses, etc. cetera. Um, so it doesn't contain uh, shelters and things that uh, um, are human um, structures. And in fact, in the Sandwich Range Wilderness of New Hampshire, which once had shelters uh, for camping throughout it. Most of those structures have been, if not all of them, have been removed uh, as a result of its designation as a wilderness area. Today, are about 106 million acres of wilderness, 56 million of which are in Alaska, um, and the rest are in the lower 48. And 56% of all the official wilderness is in national parks, the rest of it largely within um, uh, national forests. How does an area become a wilderness area? Well, there was an act of Congress in the 1970s that created a process called the Roadless Area Review uh, and an Inventory and Review. And it was the source of all wilderness designations. The federal agencies were asked to go and look at the areas within the federal ownership that had no roads. Uh, the implication being if it had no roads, it was, it was wilderness. Um, in New Hampshire, ironically, uh, the areas that have been qualified as wilderness once did have roads because almost all of the White Mountains were roaded or railroaded during the 1800s and early 20th century uh, for the purpose of removing logs, but those roads disappeared over time. And so when roadless areas were inventoried and in the White Mountain National Forest, these are areas that now have no roads, but once did. Um, so it's a bit different situation than in the West. Of course, we have wild and scenic rivers uh, after 1968 when the act was passed. Uh, originally, was a <clears throat> that act designated eight rivers uh, to be overseen by the Park Service. Since, many, since then, many more have been added, again, only by act of Congress. And the Congress has officially designated only two rivers as wild and scenic in New Hampshire, the Wildcat River in Jackson, New Hampshire, and the Lamprey River in the southeastern corner of the state. And the only thing that wild and scenic river designation really does uh, uh, in terms of conservation of a system or river system is it removes the authority of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to issue hydropower licenses on those rivers and occasionally can provide incentives for river protection if private land and regulatory protection of public land. Uh, for example, you can get funding through the uh, Wild and Scenic Rivers Act to uh, assist landowners who want to conserve their land along the, the Lamprey River, for example, in New Hampshire. There are, of course, the National Scenic and Historic Trails. All of us in the East Coast, on the East Coast, are familiar with the Appalachian Trail, originally proposed in, eight, in 1921, was already in existence. Uh, 
but the 1968 Act enabled its protection and its management by the National Park Service. Um, they, in 78, they added historic trails to the Act, such as the Oregon Trail and the Lewis and Clark Trail. And I suspect uh, there are others that are, have been designated since then, but I'm not familiar with all of that list. Coming to New Hampshire, um, state parks and forests uh, are important. Many states established park systems following the national example. Today, there are 6,600 state parks, totaling 14 million acres across the United States. And state parks serve two and a half times as many visitors as the national park system. Um, our parks in New Hampshire were established originally starting in 1881, which is fairly early. And the funding for more conservation uh, to add to the parks usually has come from state funding, but it also has come in large part from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Um, the Land and Water Conservation Fund is a federal fund, which has now been permanently authorized by Congress for the, uh, as of the last session of Congress in 2020. Um, provides up to $900 million a year from offshore oil and gas leases to fund land conservation work in the United States. Much of the LWCF funding that is raised every year goes actually to federal agencies to acquire land. Um, and oftentimes that's in holdings within national parks and forests, uh, areas surrounding national parks and forests that, uh, that potentially could threaten the, the resource if they were developed. But there is a state program as well that provides grants to the individual states and those states can use them for a variety of purposes, including um, uh, recreational facilities like tennis courts and ball fields and things like that. So the Land and Water Conservation Fund is a bit of a misnomer uh, in terms of the name because it actually does fund considerable amounts of recreational activity and programs uh, within the states. There, of course, is the Farm Bill. It's reauthorized every five years um, and that has provided funding for farm and ranch land protection, for wetlands and grassland protection. And of course, Today, we have state programs such as the Land and Community Heritage Investment Program in New Hampshire, as, as well as uh, bond issues in many states to um, uh, fund land conservation. Maine has the Land for Maine Future Board, uh, which is funded periodically through acts of the legislature and through um, uh, citizen initiatives. And, and um, they have a, uh, what, what's the word called there? In Maine, you can put items on the ballot through petition. And sometimes the funding is, uh, proposed that way. Um, local programs uh, in municipalities, uh, many towns in New Hampshire take land use change tax from the current use law, put it into the conservation fund and use that for land acquisition and protection, as well as just general appropriations from uh, tax revenue. And of course, money for land conservation oftentimes come from private donors and foundations. Uh, the two big national organizations that do that, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, the Pew Trust, are very important to this work, as are, for example, the, the Walton Family Foundation, which funds land conservation through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. We'll talk a little bit about private land trusts. Uh, the nation's first land trust, the Trustees of Reservations, was established in 1891 in Massachusetts. The second one, uh, the Sempervirens Fund, uh, Sempervirens refers to um, the, the redwoods uh, and the coastal redwoods and the, and the sequoias, um, which were the focus of that organization. Um, that was established in 1900. It was an organization that helped to protect the redwoods uh, and then went into a period of relatively quiet activity for a number of years and is now active again, as I'm told. And of course, the third oldest land trust in the United States is our own Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forest, founded in 1901. For those of you that aren't familiar, the Trustees of Reservation has about 100 properties across Massachusetts, uh, something in the order of 25,000 acres. They have a big focus on coastline and they own a beautiful um, reservation at Crane Beach, just south of the New Hampshire border in uh, Ipswich, Massachusetts. But they're also very much involved in historic houses, gardens, and structures, and they have a huge number of um, uh, facilities that they have to maintain uh, under that area. Sempervirens Fund um, was designed, as I mentioned earlier, to create a state park to protect the coastal redwoods. And they succeeded in 1902 with the creation of the Big Basin State Park, which is still uh, a state park in California. <clears throat> 
little bit of history of the Forest Society for those who aren't familiar with it. It was founded originally uh, because of the concerns over the loss of forest cover in the White Mountains and the impact it had on rivers and streams in New Hampshire. Um, and it was a forest reserve in the White Mountains was the, uh, was the, was the call back in 1901. Um, the bill was passed, the Wakes Act was passed, the White Mountains was one of the first two national forests created in the United States. The other was Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina. Um, and the uh, uh, White Mountains, in fact, today is probably the most complete of all the White, of all the Weeks Act forests in terms of the total area that was authorized for acquisition. The largest percentage of that that has actually been protected and added to the National Forest is in the White Mountains. Um, every forest has what is called a proclamation boundary by virtue of the, the uh, legislation that created it, which authorized the Forest Service to acquire land within that boundary. Um, but all of it has to be had to had to be acquired from uh, private ownership, and so in many places, all that land has not yet been acquired from private ownership and remains in private ownership. Um, the Forest Society went on to help create Crawford Notch State Park in 1908, um, or, or, or I should say, uh, started with that effort in 1911. The Weeks Act created the Eastern National Forest System. And in the same year, 1911, the Forest Society acquired 638 acres on Mount Sunapee, which is now Mount Sunapee State Park. And we won't get into the controversies associated with that. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with them, uh, with the current uses of Mount Sunapee. Um, in 1912, the Society acquired the Lost River, Res River Reservation in the White Mountains uh, and uh, still owns White the Lost River Reservation. It's managed today by the White Mountains Attractions Association. As a, um, uh, as a tourist attraction. And then, uh, and then in 1915, the first land was acquired on Mount Monadnock. Um, today, that's one of the society's largest properties. And in 1918, began acquisition of land on Mount Kearsarge, much of which was later turned over to the state for um, Kearsarge um, uh, State Park. And what many people don't recall is that until 1920, I guess between the early 1800s and 1920, there were no beavers in New Hampshire. They had been essentially extirpated by trapping uh, by the early explorers and settlers to the state. Uh, and the Forest Society decided to reintroduce beavers into New Hampshire at Lost River. And that was the first successful introduction of beavers back into New Hampshire. In 1923, there was a campaign to purchase 6,000 acres in Franconia Notch. At the time, Franconia Notch was a scenic attraction. There was, uh, there had been a hotel at the Profile House uh, just below the uh, uh, slopes on uh, Cannon Mountain. Uh, and the land was being eyed by a logger for a, uh, basically a large scale clear cut forestry operation. Um, and the Forest Society led a campaign with a number of other organizations, including the Associated Women's Club of New Hampshire, to buy the property and give it to the state park. Um, they acquired it for $400,000 in 1928, and the society managed the flume uh, until 1947, ostensibly for the purpose of helping to um, uh, <laughs> raise some of the money that helped uh, buy the land in the first place. Um, and, uh, and then they turned it over to the state park system in 1947. In 1938, you'll recall there was a massive hurricane and billions of board feet of timber were blown over in New Hampshire, something we haven't seen in a very long, long time. And the Forest Society led an effort to salvage about 400 more million board feet of that timber. That's a lot of wood. Um, the society gave the land on Mount Sunapee to the state in 1948, they established the tree farm program in 1950, if you're familiar with that. Um, in 1971, the Forest Society negotiated the first conservation easement in New Hampshire. And many people are not aware that conservation easements, which are really a tool of choice for private landowners to conserve their land today, um, didn't exist before 1971. And in fact, in 1971, when they were originally created, there was no law that enabled them to be created. Um, the idea that you could put a permanent conservation restriction on land and that it would go with the land in perpetuity was really a violation of English common law. And I think it was about 1973 
that New Hampshire enacted a statute that actually said it's okay to do this, <laughs> and and they will run in perpetuity, and it's an exception to the general rule in English common law, uh, the rule against perpetuities. In '73, um, the society led the successful effort to create current use assessment, and today, if I'm not mistaken, about 84 percent of all the land that qualifies for current use in New Hampshire is enrolled in current use. And in 86, the Trust for New Hampshire Lands was created and the Land Conservation Investment Program was created the next year and uh, ran for a period of about five or six years. It was designed to be a, uh, a program that would run for a period of time and then sunset and close, close its doors. And it did after it protected, I think about 100,000 acres in the state. Uh, the grants were made to communities and to state agencies to acquire land. And then in 1991, the, the really largest, then the largest conservation easement in the nation was created through the donation of the Faulkner family on the uh, 11,000 acre Andorra forest in Stoddard and other communities in central South New Hampshire. And then in uh, 1997, the society acquired its 100th permanent reservation. And now I think it's well up close to 180. Um, and then we created uh, together with another, another, another group of organizations, including Audubon and others, the Land and Community Heritage Investment Program, or LCHIP, which we all know about today. And then in 2001, this society was 100 years old. So um, Forest Society is, uh, if you will, the largest conservation landowner in the state. And in fact, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Forest Society may be the fifth largest landowner in the state uh, outside of um, well, including state agencies. Um, let's talk a little bit about state lands. There are 124 wildlife management areas managed by New Hampshire Fish and Game. Many people aren't aware of how many wildlife management areas Fish and Game is responsible for, uh, and many of them have been acquired in recent years. It's about 53,000 acres. Um, the most recent additions have been in the Great Bay Area, acquired with federal funds through the Great Bay Resource Protection Partnership, of which Audubon uh, has been a member. Um, and those lands are now managed by various members of the Great Bay Resource Protection Partnership, including Audubon. The state forests are managed under the new Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, uh, the Division of Forests and Land. Um, and the total number of state parks and forests totals 201,000 plus acres uh, in 221 properties, 145 towns. And of course, the largest is the Nash Dream Forest that was acquired by the state through the uh, LCIP, Land, Land Conservation Investment Program, back in 1988. And it's 39,601 acres, it's virtually the entire watershed of Nash Dream. The first state park was Miller State Park on Pacmanadnock in 1881. That's well known to Audubon folks because of the raptor observation uh, facility there. Um, and, and was originally managed by the State Forestry Department. Um, it was reorganized the, as the Division of Recreation after World War II. And, uh, and our newest state park uh, in 2007 was Jericho State Park, which is up in the Berlin area and well known to people who are fans of all-terrain vehicles because it's essentially it's been set up as a, an ATV park. Um, there are 66 state parks today. And Pisgah is the largest. If you haven't been to Pisgah in the southwestern part of the state, uh, it's worth a visit, 13,000 acres. So what have we accomplished? 36% of the area of New Hampshire is conservation land. Um, I would point out that of the eastern states, east of the Mississippi, New Hampshire has the highest percentage of land in conservation of any state. Um, that may be changing or may have changed recently because Maine has become very successful at conserving some very large blocks of land. Um, but I don't believe it approaches 36% of the total area of the state yet. Um, it's worth checking. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Forest Society is among the five largest landowners. White Mountain National Forest is, of course, the largest piece of conservation land at 750,000 acres. And the Nature Conservancy has assisted with the protection of 294,000 acres. And the largest of those is the Connecticut Lakes Headwaters, which a number of conservation organizations were involved with. I worked on that when I was with the Forest Society. The Nature Conservancy was very much involved. The Trust for Public Land was very much involved. Um, 
uh, and it probably is the largest recent, uh, at least in our lifetime, uh, conservation success story in New Hampshire. So other large New Hampshire land trusts, um, Audubon doesn't consider itself officially a land trust, but it's as the owner of eight to 10,000 acres of land, it, it, uh, it, it sort of qualifies. Um, there are obviously regional land trusts around the state, and you're all probably familiar with the, those that are in your area. The Manana Conservancy, Lakes Region, Piscataquag Land Conservancy, Southeast Land Trust, uh, Emanusa Conservation Trust, Five Rivers, et cetera. Um, they cover much of the state, which is a relatively new phenomenon. Most of those regional land trusts didn't exist back in 1986, um, and they have come into uh, uh, their, into a, um, a real stage of high, high, excuse me, high amounts of success. Uh, the Trust for Public Land, which is really not a land trust per se, it acts essentially as a interim holder of land that is intended for conservation, has been very successful at acquiring land and then transferring it to municipalities and state agencies for protection. And of course, there's the regional New England Forestry Foundation, which operates in all six of the New England states. Um, again, just summarizing, we talked a little bit earlier about this. Um, Audubon has 39 sanctuaries, uh, 8,000 acres more or less. Um, the largest is uh, Willard Pond down in the Antrim and Hancock area at uh, 1,793 acres. Um, and right now there's an effort to expand the conservation down there being led by the Harris Center on, on the pond, uh, excuse me, on the stream that flows out of Willard Pond. I'll mention a little bit more about the uh, International Paper Connecticut Lakes Project. Uh, this land was all owned by International Paper prior to its acquisition, um, uh, of, prior to the acquisition of a conservation easement by the state of New Hampshire. The land is largely still owned, except for the land you see here in green, dark green, which is owned by uh, the state in the case of the uh, Connecticut Lakes Headwaters piece up the top, subject to conservation easement held by the Nature Conservancy. Um, the uh, gray area is still owned by a private landowner. It's called uh, the Connecticut uh, Lakes, I can't remember the exact name, um, but it's, it's, it's subject to a conservation easement held by the state of New Hampshire through the Division of Forests and Lands and, the, and managed, the recreation is managed by the Parks Department. Um, and let's see, on to the next slide. Uh, land trusts in America in general, uh, there are 1,281 active land trusts, according to the most recent census of the Land Trust Alliance. Um, land trusts have 207,000 volunteers that do good work for those land trusts, 4.6 million members, and 61 million acres protected. Now, if you go back and remember the size of the national park system, land trusts have conserved an area equal to the size of the entire national park system, which is quite an accomplishment. Um, because it's all done voluntarily by uh, nonprofit organizations. In New Hampshire, we have 31 active land trusts. Um, sorry for the typo in this slide. Uh, more than 820,000 acres of land are protected um, through fee, conservation easement, and assist by, uh, by those land trusts. Um, they have 115 full-time staff, um, 44 part-time staff. That's quite a large collection of of professionals involved in this work. And as far as I know, they still have about 31,000 under members and financial supporters. So now got, let me talk a little bit about uh, conservation options for New Hampshire landowners, because that's one of the uh, uh, things that this webinar is supposed to touch on. This conservation uh, publication called Conserving Your Land, Options for New Hampshire Landowners is available for the New Hampshire Land Trust Coalition. Um, you can get it on their website. You can download either a high resolution or low resolution, excuse me, low resolution copy. Um, and it's really the best document I can recommend for someone who's interested in uh, conserving their property. Um, it was developed by a group of professionals who work for the land trust in New Hampshire, as well as through the cooperative extension service at UNH. Talk a little bit about the methods for land conservation. Uh, obviously, there's really two primary ways. One is the conveyance of fee ownership or outright ownership of the land. Uh, the outright ownership of land is called fee ownership. Um, 
And land can be conserved by the transfer of that ownership to a conservation organization or an agency. Uh, it could be a town, uh, it could be a state agency, it could be a federal agency. But when the land that ownership is transferred, that's called the conveyance of fee ownership. That's either done through a gift in the case of many of the lands that are owned by land trusts in New Hampshire, the land was given, many of Audubon sanctuaries were given to it by generous landowners. Um, and then the land trust or the organization becomes responsible for the long-term and permanent stewardship of that property. Conservation easements, on the other hand, are a legal tool that essentially leaves the land ownership in the hands of the person who donates or sells the conservation easement, but transfers the rights to develop or convert the land to non-conservation uses to the land trust, the town, the state or the federal agency. So in effect, what you've done is separate the bundle of rights that go with land ownership. When one acquires a parcel of land uh, in the United States, you acquire a set of rights uh, that go with it, the right to drill a well, the right to build on it, the right to uh, farm it, the right to forest it, a variety of things like that go with ownership, obviously under some limitations based upon local zoning and rules and regulations, but those rights travel with the ownership of the land. What a conservation easement does is it takes some of those rights and separates them out from the ownership of the land and, and puts them in the hands of someone who will uh, ensure that those rights are not used so that the land essentially remains in open space uses uh, ongoing into the future. The process uh, for a gift or a sale of land, uh, the land trust or the government entity first has to determine, do they wanna own this parcel of land? The land trust will ask you if you uh, uh, are interested in donating land, if they can understand what's there. They'll wanna look at their maps to find out what the resources are. They'll wanna consult with the, the data that exists on wildlife habitats, on water quality, uh, on the condition of the forest to determine whether it's a parcel that's within their mission and their capacity to provide the long-term ownership. They wanna know what those conservation values are so they can be consistent with the mission of that organization. They'll want the landowner to discuss that gift or proposed sale with the family members. Um, it's really important that all the people in a family or, or in a group that own a parcel of land are involved in the discussion. So there are no misunderstandings as the process goes forward. Expenses have to be identified. Will there be a survey needed? Will there be an appraisal to determine the value of the land either for tax purposes or in order to establish what the purchase price will be? Um, land trusts are obligated to pay no more than the fair market value when they buy a parcel of land, and so an appraisal is necessary to determine what that is. Um, there'll be a title examination. Is the property free and clear of all encumbrances? Uh, are there any liens on the property? Meaning, does not someone have a claim against the landowner for some past job they did there and didn't get paid for? Um, is there a hazardous waste review or inspection required? And generally speaking today, that's done every time just to make sure that there's nothing on the property that could become a liability for the new owner as it goes forward. And of course, there'll be a natural resource inventory of sorts uh, done by the land trust or the agency to find out you know, exactly what's out there. Are there rare endangered species on the property? Uh, what's the condition of the forest? Uh, is there groundwater under the property that could be valuable or important from a community water resource point of view? Um, and then, are there possible restrictions that have to be identified that would come with the land? Does the landowner want the land trust to use it for a specific purpose? And would those restrictions be acceptable to the new owner, uh, the land trust or the agency? So the process for a gift or sale or conservation easement, similar to transferring land, but with possible additional steps. Uh, for example, if the landowner wants to reserve certain rights or retain those rights, for, let me give you an example. A simple one is the uh, conservation easement normally prohibits residential housing development on the property. And, it, and since that is a prohibition, the landowner would be giving up the right to perhaps build a new house for themselves or some member of their family on the property, unless they reserved a right to do that on some portion of the property. That could be by carving out a particular part of the property from the gift or from the sale of the easement, or it could be by reserving a location that it could be put in the future. Um, negotiation restrictions. Uh, there are lots of restrictions that come with conservation easements, and I'm not gonna get into all those. You can look them up in the book that I mentioned earlier. 
Some are required by, by, uh, by law uh, and by the tax code and some are optional. Um, if there's a federal income tax sought uh, by the donor or a, uh, or a person who bargain sells a, a conservation easement, by bargain selling, I mean, if you determine the value of the easement and say, for an example, $100,000 and Leonard says, well, I'll actually uh, only sell, sell it for $50,000, they've made a bargain sale and they can claim a federal tax deduction or can seek a federal tax deduction for $50,000 that they gave up in value. Then that, there has to be a qualified appraisal done to determine what that value is. And the landowner has to pay for that because it's the landowner who'll be claiming the tax deduction. Um, and a qualified holder must take the easement according to the tax law. I can't just give it to your next door neighbor or uh, uh, the local uh, boys club. It has to be a conservation organization that's qualified under the, the tax law. How long might it take? If it's a donation, the process could take as little as six to nine months if uh, the organization uh, needs to do it quickly or if the landowner needs to do it quickly. I've seen land uh, easement sales and donations take as long as a decade, depending on the complexity of the project, the number of uh, members of the family in the uh, ownership of the property and whether or not they agree on how to proceed and need to find agreement. Um, if it's a sale or a bargain sale, a process is often extended by the time it takes for the land trust to raise the money to acquire the property. Um, there are a lot of different places and ways land trusts and agencies can acquire funding. A state agency might acquire funding through the Land and Water Conservation Fund that we mentioned earlier, or through uh, the Fish Habitat Fund at Fish and Game, or the Wildlife Habitat Fund at Fish and Game. Um, there may be other sources of funding granted to them through the legislature to acquire land for parks, et cetera. But the single most important funding source in New Hampshire right now is LCHIP, which has grant cycles once a year. Um, and over the course of the last few years, have been granting three to four to $5 million a year to land trusts and uh, mostly land trusts and municipalities who uh, are, are doing land conservation projects. I shouldn't say that amount of money has gone all to land conservation because that three to $5 million has generally been split between land conservation and historic preservation, which of course is part of LCHIP. So what might this whole process cost the landowner um, uh, and the easement holder land recipient? There's a lot of things that, that uh, could take some money, a title review done by an attorney or a title review or a survey done by a licensed professional surveyor, legal review by attorneys, staff time at the land trust, uh, the people who actually put the project together. So the land trusts often hire uh, professionals, uh, consultants to do hazardous waste review. And there are other expenses that could be uh, associated with this, but these are the big ones. If the land or easement is being purchased, the land trust will need to confirm the value with an appraisal and they will generally um, commission that appraisal. Um, and uh, if there's a bargain sale component to the project, um, the appraisal will be done by the land trust to determine how much it can pay, but then the landowner will have to have a, an appraisal done for them for the purposes of justifying an income tax return. Sometimes they're done by the same appraiser. Sometimes the appraiser can go back and, and write one for the donor or the bargain seller based on the data they've gathered for the land trust, but they have to be two separate documents so that the uh, uh, purposes of each of them is satisfied. Money. Most land trusts require the landowner to cover some or all of the transaction costs for the for a land or easement donation. Uh, in this case, that would be uh, those expenses I mentioned earlier, survey, title review, et cetera. Um, when land or easements are being purchased, the land trust often covers the cost of the transaction, except for the seller's appraisal, uh, and rolls those into a, a fundraising campaign that they do to raise the money. Uh, which could include a grant to LCHIP, it could include uh, seeking funding from a local municipality's conservation fund, it, it could uh, include private fundraising uh, to the people in the community, and often does. Um, costs, the transaction costs of a project can range from a few thousand dollars to many thousands of dollars, and I did put an upper limit on that one because a really big project can, uh, can get very expensive um, because of the uh, transaction costs. 
Um, it's important to note that if a landowner is donating a conservation easement or a piece of land, the costs they incur to make that donation are also tax deductible under the federal tax law. So anyway, this has been a really basic overview of land conservation project. Um, they are much more complex uh, in many cases than this can explain. And that's why I suggested you buy or you download, I should say, the Conserving Your Land booklet from nhltc.org, New Hampshire Land Trust Coalition.org. Um, it's, uh, it's a great publication and, um, and can lead you through a decision-making process to what might work best for you if you're a landowner considering land conservation. And most of the New Hampshire Land Trust now have someone on their staff, they might call them one, something other than a land protection specialist, but that is the general title of the position, whose job it is to discuss land conservation with you if, if you're a landowner and the options that might work best for you and help you work through the answers to the questions um, that you have about how to conserve your land. So there you go. That's the end of my slides. And I guess it's time to answer questions. And I'm hoping that uh, between Diane and Slater, we have some questions uh, in the chat box. And if you have some questions, put them there or the Q&A and we'll go from there. And I will stop sharing. There we go. Thanks, Paul. Really appreciate that. Um, my internet connection is unstable, so just let me know if you can't actually hear me. And here's a question from Cynthia. What about the ongoing costs of inspection, monitoring of conservation easements? Yeah, I mean, every land trust that I know of has a stewardship fund. They have actually two funds related to the ongoing monitoring and enforcement of easements. They have a conservation easement defend fund, which is designed to be available in the event of a violation or a dispute. Excuse me. Um, and they'll draw on that to help cover the costs of dealing with such things. Um, and they also have a stewardship fund which is more related to the ongoing and regular monitoring and, and uh, communication with the landowner about how to uh, uh, meet their stewardship obligations on the land. Um, those stewardship funds uh, generally are considered endowments. And so if a land trust is going to protect a property, they wanna put some money in, a, in an endowment fund that will generate income, modest income, sometimes 4% per year, uh, that will generate enough money to cover the annual monitoring of the property uh, and answering a few questions from the landowner, that sort of thing. Um, every land trust has a different formula for how to determine how much money they want to raise for that. Some ask the donor of the easement or the land to contribute to that fund in the amount that they need. Um, some will raise that money from other sources, uh, especially if they're purchasing the land or easement, they will raise the money as part of their fundraising campaign. Um, I know that uh, for many years, land trusts have had sort of a minimum amount that they want to put in their stewardship fund for every easement. Sometimes in the, in the past, it was a few thousand dollars and many of them now look to raise as much as 10 or $15,000. But my estimation is that uh, most land trusts now have a formula that they use to determine how to do that. The Piscataqua Land Conservancy, on whose board I served uh, for a number of years, actually has a, a spreadsheet, a formula that they go through the reserved rights that are going to be in the easement. They look at how many abutters there are to the easement. They look at what activities will take place. Will it be forestry? Will it be agriculture? Will, there, will a subdivision, a minor subdivision, be allowed to divide the land between uh, the heirs of the landowner? All those things add up to determine what the stewardship fund would be, and they'll ask the landowner to contribute to that, or they'll ask the community through the conservation fund to contribute to it, or if, they, if the land is a benefit to the community. So a lot of different ways to raise that money. Thanks, Paul. Um, Karen, I was just wondering what the number again was to how many land trusts there are. Um, the, the last I looked, there were 31 active land trusts in the state. Um, that number uh, can 
is not necessarily a firm number. Some people consider some organizations a land trust and others not, um, uh, depending on what they do. Uh, some people don't consider, for example, the trust for New Hampshire lands, uh, I mean, excuse me, the trust for public land, a land trust because they don't keep and hold land long-term. Whereas a organization like Audubon, which doesn't technically call itself a land trust, owns land for conservation purposes. And so it has land trust functions. So uh, the number is really not as important as the fact that there are quite a few of them and pretty much in every part of the state that you might live, there is a regional or local or statewide land trust that you can work with. Um, Rick is asking, could you talk about PILTs and why some land trusts pay them and some don't? PILTs are payments in lieu of taxes. And uh, this goes back to uh, what kind of property in New Hampshire can be considered tax exempt for property tax purposes. And certain types of property are, for example, educational institutions, churches, et cetera, um, are exempt from paying property taxes. Um, colleges and universities frequently don't pay property taxes. Land trusts, theoretically qualify uh, as a charitable organization that should not have to pay property taxes on their land. However, under New Hampshire law, they have to apply for that exemption on a town by town basis. So if you're in town A and you're a land trust that works in town A through K, you have to apply separately in every town A through K to get an exemption if you wish to seek one. And it isn't guaranteed that it'll ask that, the, excuse me, that your ask will result in a decision to give you an exemption. The selectmen or the city council make those decisions. Uh, they can be appealed to the Board of Land and Tax Appeals, et cetera, et cetera. But what a lot of land trusts have done instead is said, look, we want to contribute our fair share to providing the municipal services that we occasionally might use, fire, police protection, for example. Um, so we would like to make a payment to the town in lieu of taxes um, of a certain amount of money um, that would uh, essentially help to support the community, but not necessarily be as much as it would be as if the land were in general taxation and we'd be paying for the school system and a variety of other public recreational facilities and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that has been fairly successful for many land trusts because they've been able to keep their your expenses down. They do provide a public service with this conservation land. They protect wildlife habitat. They protect groundwater quality, protect drinking water quality. Oftentimes, wildlife habitat provide recreational opportunities for the community. So communities do recognize that land trusts provide a public service. Um, the payment in lieu of taxes acknowledges that at the same time, the, the land trust is going to potentially need the community to provide them with a service at some point in the future. Um, it's a it's a it's a negotiated on a case by case basis. I don't think there's any hard rule about how you do it, but it is um, done quite frequently. Uh, Thanks, Paul. Margaret quickly. is interested in what situation. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say um, that only applies to land that's owned by land trusts. The payment in lieu of taxes, land that's under conservation easement. The landowner is still responsible for paying the taxes. Of course, they can either, and usually they'll have the land in current use anyway. And so the creation of a conservation easement doesn't change the landowner's tax obligation. Go ahead, Diane. Thanks, Paul, for that clarification. So, Margaret's interested in what situations is an appraisal review required? Um, a variety of situations. If a landowner decides to donate any portion of the value of their land or their conservation easement, and they wish to take a federal income tax deduction, and I won't get into the rules related to that because you can read about those in the book I mentioned. But if you choose to seek that deduction, you have to have a qualified appraisal. Uh, and what that means is it needs to be prepared by an appraiser who has experience and uh, uh, and is qualified to do it. Um, just having a, for example, a, a realtor do a market analysis is not sufficient for the federal tax deduction purposes. Um, 
and you have to submit that with your income tax return to claim the deduction. The other time an appraisal is necessary is if a land trust decides to buy something from you as a landowner, whether they're buying your land or buying your conservation easement. Uh, charitable trust law in New Hampshire and across most of the United States requires that charities, land trusts, not pay anything more for a parcel of land than it is actually worth. Otherwise, they create what's known as private benefit. And charities are not allowed to create private benefit. Um, so they'll have to commission an appraisal for the purpose of determining what's the value of what we're buying from you. Um, and <clears throat> they will pay for that appraisal usually because it's for their use. And uh, that appraisal could then possibly uh, be the basis of the landowner uh, asking the same appraiser to prepare a separate appraisal for them for the tax deduction, a tax deduction they might seek, but it's two different documents. Thanks, Paul. Um, I is asking if you can talk about the role of town conservation commissions in land conservation. Sure, I, I didn't really touch on that extensively and I should uh, uh, talk about that a bit because conservation commissions have been very active in land conservation over the years. Uh, during the LCIP program back in the 1980s, many conservation commissions got grants from the LCIP program to buy uh, conservation easements on land in their communities, um, and, and they've been very successful at doing that. Um, conservation commissions are authorized under the law to, to acquire land. They have to go through a process of approval at the town level through the selectmen and public hearings, et cetera, that I won't get into the details of, um, but they can be very successful at doing that work. The challenge conservation commissions have is stewardship um, because conservation commission membership changes over time. Um, the members of the Conservation Commission in my community uh, have changed, uh, rolled over at least a dozen times in the 40 years I've lived here. Uh, and the people that are there now uh, are all relatively uh, uh, unfamiliar with the, the easements at the, as they were originally created. So they have to educate themselves and take on responsibilities. So unfortunately, I've seen some wide variance in the uh, degree to which conservation commissions are able to uphold their responsibilities if they have conservation easements. Um, and so there's an ongoing need for there to be education. The New Hampshire Association of Conservation Commissions takes that role uh, to make sure that when you join a conservation commission, you understand what your responsibilities are. Um, but, but they do great work. And uh, uh, if there are occasional um, uh, uh, situations where they fall down on the job, they can usually be corrected uh, by uh, people uh, getting the education they need and going back and figuring out what were we supposed to really be doing. I mean, one example in my own community is there was a conservation easement created back in 1982 on a property on a lake uh, associated with a development project. And um, for many, many years, that easement got monitored by the Conservation Commission. And when the, the members of the commission turned over completely. The new members of the commission had no idea they were responsible for monitoring it. Uh, somewhere along the line, the message got lost and it didn't get monitored for a number of years. Um, fortunately, nothing really went wrong on the property, but something could have. And then the town would have been in a very difficult situation of having to go back and try to uh, uh, resolve issues that they should have been on top of um, uh, from the beginning. Thanks, Paul. Can you just clarify how often a conservation commission or another easement um, holder would need to monitor the property? Uh, the there's no legal requirement for conservation commissions to monitor their properties every year, to my knowledge. But for land trusts that are accredited under the Land Trust Accreditation Commission, the National Land Trust Accreditation Commission. They are required to monitor their conservation easements every year, at least once a year. That monitoring can take place in a variety of different ways. It can be uh, on the ground monitoring, uh, uh, someone who's a volunteer with a land trust or a staff person go out, walks the property, inspects it, usually trying to get the landowner to go with them. Um, or it could be done through uh, satellite imagery as is often done now 
because satellite images are so much more um, uh, sophisticated than they used to be. Um, sometimes it's done through uh, aerial monitoring with fixed winged aircraft. And I even know some land trusts in the West that do it with drones, um, but it has to be done once a year, at least. Thanks, Paul. So, thanks. So we're circling back to Margaret's question. Um, she clarified that she meant her question to relate to appraisal reviewers versus appraisers. When do you need an appraisal reviewer? Well, that's a complicated question. There's, uh, uh, many of the federal programs that provide funding, the Forest Legacy Program uh, is a classic example of that, which it comes out of the US Forest Service. Um, and it is money granted to the states to acquire conservation easements, requires a federal review appraiser to review every appraisal. So your appraiser here in New Hampshire writes an appraisal, says the property's worth X. Uh, it has to be, that appraisal has to be reviewed by a, an appraiser that is specifically designated by the US Forest Service to review appraisals and determine whether or not that appraisal is satisfactory. Um, uh, the, right now, uh, from based on what I hear from other people in land conservation world, one of the biggest problems we have is a shortage of qualified appraisers and a severe shortage of qualified review appraisers. And I can recall during the time I worked at the Forest Society that getting a review appraiser to uh, number one, actually do the review took a long time and number two, when they did the review, when they had questions, they frequently, uh, the iterations back and forth between the appraiser who wrote the appraisal and the review appraiser could take months to sort out. Um, so it was really a substantial drag on the completion of the process. Whether that's still a problem, I don't know. Um, I suspect that it may be, be just be simply because there aren't enough people in the business of doing appraisal work. Thanks, Paul. Um, Gary's wondering how well protected is a lot if there are conservation restrictions in the deed, but there is no conservation easement on the lot. That's a really good legal question and not being a lawyer, I'm gonna give you the non-lawyer answer uh, that was taught to me by a lawyer. <laughs> um, de deed restrictions are enforceable primarily, if not exclusively, but by the entity who created them in the first place. For example, if I sell my property to my next door neighbor and I put a deed restriction in it, the deed restriction is uh, to benefit me as the seller of the property, as the abutter to the property. Um, I am authority, my, I have the authority and the right to enforce that restriction, um, but no one else does. Um, and as a result of that, if I move away or when I pass away um, and I'm no longer around, it, the question becomes who can enforce that restriction on the property? There's another challenge with deed restrictions and that they violate, they, they cannot violate the rule against perpetuities. You can't create a perpetual deed restriction. It's not allowed by the law. Conservation easement is an exception to the rule against perpetuities created by specifically by law. But there is no law that allows a deed restriction to run in perpetuity. So it has to end at some point. Um, there are different lawyers who've written them to run for 25 years, for example. Other situations say the deed restriction is enforceable by the current generation of people alive and their children who are alive today. But beyond that, it can't be enforced. So there's a question of enforceability with a deed restriction that doesn't exist with a conservation easement. And if you want a more complicated answer than that, talk to a lawyer. Thanks, Paul. Um, Andy's asking, does the easement lower or equal assess value over land rated at current use? Generally speaking, um, current, well, current use establishes tax values based upon the uses of the property. If it's a Managed forest land, there's one rate. If it's forest, if it's forage land, agricultural land, there's one rate. If it's uh, crop land, there's one rate. And, every, and the towns get to choose within a, a range of, of rates what the value is they'll charge for taxes for that property. The reality is, is that uh, when you put a conservation easement on the property, 
um, essentially, uh, it doesn't change any of that. Um, it, it means the property can't be developed, but it, your lowest tax rate will still be the current use value. Now, there's one exception to that rule, and that is properties under 10 acres. Now, you know that the current use law says you can enroll any property over 10 acres that's in open space with no buildings on it, no structures. Um, there have been those people who have put conservation easements on smaller properties, in particular waterfront properties on lakes, for example, where there's a scenic frontage or there is um, uh, a, a real desire to see a piece of land not be developed so that it can be open to the public for um, recreational use. And sometimes those properties have been less than 10 acres. Because of that, the legislature adopted a law, and I'm not recalling when, when it was done, probably in the early 90s, um, that allows land that's in current, under current, excuse me, not under current use because it doesn't qualify, but under a conservation easement to qualify for current use. So in other words, it's an exception to the 10 acre rule. If your land is on conservation easement, you can apply to the municipality to have current use be put on your less than 10 acre parcel of land and reduce the taxes. Um, this was done largely because there were some extremely valuable parcels of lakefront property in the lakes region that were put under easement that were still being taxed as if they were house lots, even though they could never be house lots. Uh, and so the, the law was written to allow them to be taxed under the current use law because it would always be open space. Thanks, Paul. And for the last question, can we circle back to uh, national? Um, Nina was in, she indicated, you indicated that the Park Service manages the Appalachian Trail. And how do they do that? There is a bureau within the National Park Service uh, that uh, manages the, uh, the use of the Appalachian Trail. Uh, they buy or and hold uh, easements for the trail to travel over. They own land that the trail is over. They even have acquired land in the view sheds of the trail. Uh, and so that portion of the Park Service, and I can't remember the exact name of the, uh, the section within the Park Service, is responsible for managing um, the trail. And it's primarily about acquiring the rights for the trail to continue to operate and uh, ensuring that the land on which it uh, runs is not uh, disrupted or interrupted by uh, by other uses. Uh, there's a nonprofit off organization called the Appalachian Trail Conservancy that is a partner agency nonprofit with the Park Service that helps to acquire those lands and then turn them over to the Park Service. They've done a lot of great work in New England and the rest of the Appalachian Trail to help make it possible to ensure that the trail is not um, uh, threatened by uh, inappropriate uses. Thanks, Paul. Um, Stephen put in here RSA 79B, which I'm assuming is uh, about current use and right. potentially smaller properties. That's um, correct. Or, if yeah. people are interested in looking closer at that. RSA 79B so, is the current Paul, use. before That's, I turn it back yeah. over. I'm sorry. Right. I'm sorry, I, just, I shouldn't be talking over Go you, ahead, I apologize. <laughs> I'll just finish by saying 79A is the current use statute, 79B was uh, uh, added to it to allow those smaller parcels to be um, uh, included in current use. And um, I was part of the team that negotiated that with the legislature. Great. So, Paul, I'd really like to thank you before I turn it back over to Slater just to kind of wrap it up so we actually have a face on here wrapping it up. And um, I would also like to thank you and share that, Paul, we're very lucky, as you have all found out tonight, if you didn't already know, many of you probably already knew, Paul has been instrumental in protecting land in New Hampshire and continues to give generously of his expertise. And that includes that he now sits on the board of New Hampshire Audubon. So we're very lucky to have him. So Slater, if you're there, I will turn it back over to you to wrap Hello. up. 
All right. There he well, is. <laughs> thanks, Diane. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone again for uh, your interest in our Exploring Connection series hosted by the New Hampshire Audubon and supported by the New Hampshire Humanities Council. Uh, I'll be sending out a link to an evaluation survey for this webinar. Uh, your feedback is really important to us as we continue to host these types of talks. Uh, and it's also really helpful in reporting back to our funder. Uh, the next talk uh, in this series will take place on January 18th, featuring Denise and Paul Puyo uh, regarding the caretakers of the Indikina. Uh, please visit our website and register for uh, that and all of the rest of our upcoming talks. Um, thank you again, Paul, for presenting this evening. And uh, thank you, Diane, for organizing this series. Uh, and thank everybody else for tuning in, learning alongside us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the webinar in the near future. Uh, for ways to get involved as a member, volunteer, or donor, uh, please visit us at newhampshireaudubon.org. Uh, otherwise, have a great evening, and thanks for coming. Thanks, Paul.